This is Blood and Firewater, a true crime comedy discussion type podcast. We shoot tequila and chase it with a case of murder. Just as a disclaimer, this podcast contains mature content not suitable for all ages, so listener discretion is advised. When you're a parent, the most important thing in the world is raising your children right. You love them, take care of them, pay for their shit, and put up with their shit. But in the end, it's so worth making your child happy. But what happens when the one thing in the world that they want for you is, well, to die? Welcome to Conyers, Georgia. And one of Rashad's worst fears. Okay, so on January 13th, 2010, in Rockdale County, Georgia, sisters Jazz and Taz come home from school to find their mother brutally stabbed and murdered in their home. Apart from looking like she had been in a brutal physical altercation, she suffered significant stab wounds to the jugular, lungs, and the back of her neck, to the point where her spinal cord was severed. She was found in the tub of her boyfriend's house in Bridal Ridge Walk Subdivision. So the girls got home from school that day, I assume like they always do, late in the afternoon and came home to find blood all over the house and their mother, Jarmika Yvonne Whitehead, dead upstairs in the bathroom tub. Jarmika Yvonne Whitehead, or Nikki, was born on April 18, 1975. She was a 34-year-old mother of identical twins, Tasmia and Tasmia Whitehead born on November 27, 1993. Taz and Jazz were both on the honor roll and active in Girl Scouts and just really great kids growing up, but they lived with their great-grandmother, Della Frazier, a majority of their childhood. All right, so Della, great-grandmother, would say that Nikki was very in and out their lives, but in 07, when the kids turned 13, Nikki wanted custody of the girls back. Everybody knows how much you can get away with at Grandma's house, but at Great Grandma's house, I can imagine they were getting away with hella shit. So, Mama trying to regain the control back, I bet the twins saw her as a threat. But nonetheless, her attempts to control them became hypocritical of the life that she had lived. Nikki reportedly stayed out late, smoked weed, and had at least two boyfriends. (laughs) So, Nikki had a rough start, though. She was born in a prison. You know how parents have those like headphones and shit they play with babies, like nursery rhymes or classical music and shit like in the womb? Well, Nikki had bull dykes and COs to whisk her away to sleep every night. Nikki didn't have her curfew. She probably had several opportunities to experiment with drugs or alcohol. Possibly how she probably ended up 17 and pregnant. Not victim shaming whatsoever. It's just what happens every time. Yeah, you've seen the show 16 and Pregnant. Like, what made you think they weren't motivated to keep getting pregnant? So she picks the girls up and moves to Conyers, Georgia in 2007 with her boyfriend, Robert Head, whom she'd been living with since 2000. Nikki put the twins in music lessons and dance classes. She bought them makeup and expensive clothes and basically kept the girls just as spoiled, just like when they were at Great Grandma's house. And they were straight-A students. But when they hit high school, things started to change for them. They started to hear the word no a lot more. And that was some shit they weren't ready for. This shit's crazy. Like, luckily, I only got one person to deal with. If I tell her no, she's like, ah, oh, okay. And then she just moves on with her life. You, out on the other hand. I got twins. You tell, you, you tell Bree no. She's like... She's going to go back and tell Kennedy, hey, fuck that bitch. We're going to fight her as soon AP. Yeah, I mean, I've told you the little slick shit that I've heard them say. And just of how much forensic shit that I watch and ID and all this crazy shit with people killing their parents. The shit crosses my mind. It does. But I'm just like, nah. So... That's that. I just sweep it away. His aunt hear it. He was like, what'd you say about your mama? <laughs> um, so Nikki took Taz's phone one day when she was 14 because she was talking to a 17-year-old boy. Let my daughter want to kill me for some strange. And I swear I'll end getting strange for the both of us. Um, 
So she also started enforcing rules on them like you can't be out after a certain time. You have a curfew now and you can't be on the phone after a certain time unless it's the weekend. Were minutes a big deal in 2010? No. Are you sure? Like, I, I, I never had minutes. So, like, when people would be like, I, I got minutes. I, yeah, but you remember when it was free after nine on cell phones? You don't remember that? It was like nights and weekends or some shit like that. Yeah, but that wasn't, like, when we lived in Hickory Ridge, that's when that was a thing. That was when minutes were a thing, and I was just now hitting ninth grade. So it couldn't have been in 2010 because I would have graduated in 2010. I feel like minute, like, I, I remember, minute like, you had, like, and then, like, it went from, like, nights and weekends to, like, these five people you could call without using your minutes. And I was like, wait, how the fuck does that work? You know? It was, like, your fave five or some shit like that. That was, like, that was, like, during the MySpace days when, like, people were, like, well, I'm not in your top eight. Bro, Facebook was around. It wasn't MySpace. But... It's 2019, so you're thinking of some shit from nine years ago when it, in fact, was about 12, 13 years ago. Because in 2010, I would have been graduating high school with my iPhone and all that other shit. I don't know where the fuck you were in 2010, but that was the last thing I was worried about. You know, every when you live at Mama House, everything runs up the bills, you know what I'm saying? So, let's, let, e either way... Money is the biggest motivator of why parents do the things that they do. More than half of the time, I'm going to say. So maybe it had something to do with that. Parents don't, n normally, you're not going to tell your 14-year-old child about your financial situation. Uh, I mean, I feel like that's something I need to know. If I'm going to be fucking up a check, I'd like to know. Well, either way, that's when the kids snap. They were like, fuck that. We can jump her. There's two of us. Period. So they jumped her. Cops get called, and then everybody plays nice. But this one officer, Myra Scruggs, could tell something was off. Just by looking at Nikki, she knew that she was scared of these girls. I mean, she was getting jumped <laughs> by her own kids. Physically and verbally. I don't know where the boyfriend is at this point, but... Like, I don't know, it's hard to intervene with a mother-daughter dispute. So, maybe he just doesn't get involved. But he's a truck driver, so maybe he just wasn't there and he was out of town or something. That's the truck driver's description, just not there. He might even made up the fact that he was a truck driver, just to not fucking be around her and those twins. Police came back, and they all play the blame game. The twins say the mom started hitting them and screaming that they were not going back out. But the mom is the only one with bruises and scratches. Proof that she was the one being abused. So the physical evidence lands the twins with assault charges. And that landed them into counseling and several court appearances. So grandma or great grandma gets custody back. And the family chalks the behavior up to the girls just being teenagers. So uh, somehow Nikki gets custody back on January 5th, 2010. The court ordered them to live with their mother for a two-week trial period to see if the counseling has worked. Nikki was killed on January 13, 2010, eight days later. Eight fucking days later. Like, I, I don't know. Like, if it got to the point where me and my daughter needed counseling to make sure I don't get murdered because she's obviously already put her hands on me one time or two times. Or a three. I don't know. I mean, January 5th through the 13th doesn't even seem like eight days. That seems like the next day this woman was dead. Like, Just like, yeah, judge, we'll try it out. Yeah. Next day. Then probably was the slowest eight days of that woman's life. The worst eight days of her life at that. But in the same, I don't know, I guess the same instant of those girls just, like, playing that shit. Like, let's do what she say and kill her on the 13th. Was it a Friday? I wonder. How can you make that assumption? Because it's the 13th. I don't know. Maybe they went with eight days. Maybe they were, like, eight minutes apart. I'm just thinking like a... Tw no, I'm just thinking like a twin at this point. 
Like, Brielle and Ken are 12 minutes apart, so they would probably fuck me up on the 12th month of the year. 12th minute of the hour. Nah, they're not. They're five right now. It's fine. We'll start looking closely when they turn 13, 14 years old. So, January 13th, 2010, the girls walk into their home and see a bloodbath had taken place in the living room and find their mother in the tub. They run out the house and tell the police officer who was conveniently in their neighborhood that their mother was a victim of a heinous murder. Heinous? Is it heinous? All right. They run out of the house and tell the police officer who is conveniently in their neighborhood that their mother was a victim of a heinous murder. She was stabbed 80 times with a kitchen knife. Her spinal cord nearly cut severed in half. Yes. It's like fuck. (laughs) I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just like fuck. Fuck. I mean, fuck. being stabbed 80 times was just enough. I mean, being stabbed five times was enough. I mean, you know, we had Tanya that did that. See, the thing about stabbing is that's, first off, that's the most personal way to, to for a killer. Yeah, that or strangulation. Because for one, it doesn't, you, don't, you don't get stabbed. And then she's like, oh, that means every like, mark, every mark stab 36. She was like, bro, <laughs> <laughs> bro, help. So it says with a kitchen knife. Man, damn. I got to rewatch this shit. Like, I need pictures and videos. What the fuck? She's 16. Like, and they honestly, in the mugshot, look like eight-year-old Asians. Like, but, oh. Should I say that? <laughs> I mean, they still look really childlike. They still look young to me. Like, because I've seen a 16-year-old walk around motherfucking South Carolina and not look 16. These kids look 16 or under. Not 16 and older, like the shit that I see. I'm just like, this woman was a grown-ass woman. So what was one sister doing to keep her from defending herself that the other sister wasn't. Like, ah. That's why I'm saying, like, I need graphics. I need a straight documentary coming out they mouth. Like, I need the whole shit. (laughs) Medical examiners called the murder a crime of passion due to the profile of murder. So, I probably should hit them up for the autopsy. (laughs) There was no forced entry. Which meant she probably knew who killed her and let them in the house. Nothing was missing, so it wasn't a burglary. And the manner in which it was taken out, you would think it was a jealous boyfriend or something like that. So cops didn't automatically think that two 16-year-old girls were even capable of something like this. So investigators drive the twins down to the station. And the whole time, Jazz is just biting and chewing at her arm. Nothing, Nothing off about that, right? This bitch was chewing her arm. Something's wrong. You, what'd you do? <laughs> like, or, 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 or like something you would do when you get upset. Never have I ever seen anybody do that. I'm just saying. But I can't really think of anything that Brielle does. Uh, no. Not even. She doesn't do anything. Kennedy does all the weird shit. She does enough weird shit for Brielle and Kennedy both. I feel like if that was Jazz, okay, so Jazz was the one biting on her arm, right? Taz probably was just like, oh, she's just weird like that. Like, no, she's not. That's something off with your sister. Hence why she probably planned out this murder on your mom. And you was just okay in that this whole fucking time. So in my defense, Brielle could be like, no. Y'all seen Kennedy smelling socks and fucking tissue paper and just random shit. But y'all didn't say nothing. Y'all don't see me doing nothing like that. Like, I literally cannot think of anything weird that Brielle does. I cannot. But I can tell you at least five weird things that Kennedy do. So it would... I just, um... would Scientifically or what? It would be Kennedy that planned to kill me and Brielle carrying it out investigators had them in that interrogation room for a while and the twins began to start cracking before they even got to question the boyfriend 
<laughs> I'm sorry, that's funny. They're crying, but not like crying like they just lost their mother crying, like without tears crying, whining, if you will, my guess is. Trying to get sympathy points out of the interrogators. They're comforting each other with hugs and kisses, like mouth kisses. Ew. Like mouth kisses. Weird. <laughs> That's fucking weird. So they're mouth kissing each other, and this is the most emotion that they've shown since the discovery of the body. So investigators try and comfort them. And they ask what they can do to help because they have been there so long. And these stupid bitches respond with requesting to watch CSI. Investigators start to dial in on the sisters now, obviously. They pick up on the fake crying. They start to take note that whenever they were asked about their mother and how they felt about her, they'd say negative, insulting things about her. They also realize that the twins have been wearing gloves the entire interrogation. So they tell them to take them off and photographed their hands, and their hands were fucked up, but they put the blame on fighting each other. Meanwhile, back at the crime scene, investigators find a pair of shoes in the back of Jazz's closet that had blood on them. Not a big deal, right? A house with three women, some may come in contact with someone else's blood or their own blood. Maybe, I mean, they fight a lot, but then investigators find another pair of shoes with blood on them in Taz's room. And these shoes had significantly more blood than the other shoes, but what's worse was inside of one of the boots was a clump of hair rolled up in a paper towel inside of the shoe. Not like a clump of hair you would find in a shower type clump, but a bloody clump. Along with that evidence, the investigators note that all the sinks in the house had been wiped clean. Um, With the boyfriend and the twins' father ruled out, investigators turn up the heat on the twins and begin drilling them for answers. The girls turn up their act because they know they're suspects now. So maybe they didn't feel that they were convincing enough so all their acts had been amplified to full-blown temper tantrums. The girls pull out a big gun excuse and say that they missed the bus the morning of the murder and had to walk to school and they left at 7.30. So detectives got their surveillance tapes from the gas stations that would be on their route to school that day and it told a different story. The tape at the gas station showed that they got into a car and hitched a ride to school. Authorities say... Oh. Authorities also seized video from the school, and it shows the girls didn't arrive till 10.38 a.m. After telling the detectives... After telling detectives that they were only 10 minutes late. Detectives started catching them in lies. Again, the twins amp up their temper tantrums and become argumentative and non-cooperative. Finally... Detectives split them up, which is something they should have done in the first place, but whatever. Being split up like that should have been the first tactic taken to see their stories, to see if their stories even match. But after splitting them up, it significantly helped break the girls down. They started asking the detectives why they were being questioned as as if they did something or had anything to do with the murder. But all detectives at this point is circumstantial evidence had... What? Try this again. They started asking the detectives why they are being questioned as if they did something or had anything to do with the murder. But all detectives have, at this point, is circumstantial evidence prior to testing. Nothing is really putting the girls at the scene of the crime other than the fact that they left early that morning. So they missed the bus and lied about being at school on time. Big deal. That doesn't make them murderers. With that, cops can't keep them any longer and they're released to their great-grandmother. So the girls go back to their normal life while police test the evidence and keep them under surveillance for the next four months. They're hanging out with friends at school, going to prom, just being normal high school students, all the while police are getting ready to hand their asses right back to them because they're not done with them just yet. Okay, so earlier when Jazz was in the backseat of the cop car, she was chewing on her arm as like a nervous twitch when she was actually trying to hide the bite mark her mom had left her on her arm trying to get away from them. A dental exam was performed and indicated that the bite mark on Jazz's arm matched the dental records of Nikki's teeth imprint. Human hair foreign to Nikki is found in her teeth, corroborating that she's fighting for her life to get away from her attackers, and she bit down as hard as she could to get away. So one twin was behind her, 
attacking her, presumably while the other one was in front attacking her. Now, cops have probable cause and the girls are picked up on the last day of school, May 21st, 2010, because they were considered a flight risk. They were charged with aggravated assault and felony murder. Of course, they denied. Uh, of course, they denied it, telling police, I'm not going down for something I didn't do. Please find a murder weapon. So off the jail they go. Not the same jail, though. While awaiting trial in January 2014, Taz pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter. One month later, Jazz also pleads guilty to the same shit. So the twins finally confess to the murder of their mother. Jazz confesses to stabbing her multiple times while Taz confessed to participating in the joint effort of the murder. Um, the state made a plea deal and both received 30 years in prison. Taz is in... Or Taz is at the Pulaski? Pulaski? Are you going to help me out, bro? Taz is at the Pulaski State Prison and Jazz is at the Arendelle State Prison. They both went up for parole in 2017, but after some further... But after some further sleuthing, they are both still in prison. <laughs> I'm not doing it over. You're just going to be laughing in the background. <laughs> On January 28th, 2019... Arendelle State Prison hosted its first ever Life University College graduation, and Jasmia received her Associates of Arts and Positive Human Development. Tasmia is now a student in the Ashland University degree program. She is obtaining her degree in business, art, and communication. All right now, I don't see them getting these jobs in psychology and shit like that when they lost their goddamn mind. If they serve the whole sentence, they'll only be in their 40s when they get out. But it's hard to even fathom two kids who come from what somewhat of a decent background and, you know, basically straight A students could possibly do this as someone like their own fucking mom. Only 2% of homicides are kids killing their parents. And of that 2%, only 15% of those are daughters killing their mothers. So it's pretty rare that this type of incident happens. I don't think that. There's any kind of study about twins, so this must be like super duper rare. So, my my one of my fears, it goes in the top three, is my kid trying to come after me because I told her no. I told her no, you can't go out, and I'm gonna take your cell phone, and you'll get it back when I say so, and then I go to wake you up for school in the morning, and then you stab me eighty times. That's got to be the worst outcome for me trying to be looking out for your fucking education. So that's the story of Jarmika Yvonne Whitehead and her two prison college graduate daughters. So episode one is done. If you like the show, we'd love to have your support. It costs you zero dollars and zero cents to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. It helps incredibly to promote the show so other people may find us. If you want to find me, you can find me on Instagram at Blood and Fire Water Podcast and Twitter at BFW Pod Squad. You got a case you want us to cover? We got a spot for you on our Patreon page. Check it out. We got some great merch on there. We got merch coming soon. And you can start with only a dollar a month. Thanks for listening. Stay alert, stay alive.